All right, everyone. So thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Debbie Archer. I'm the education manager for Audubon Vermont. And this is a joint um, endeavor today. So I'm also joined by Aaron Talmadge from the Birds of Vermont Museum. If you have not been out to visit us, our properties um, touch, <laughs> we're neighbors and we actually have trails that connect um, from one another and together our properties form an important bird area. Um, but we're not talking about birds today. We are talking about beetles. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Erin from uh, the Birds Vermont Museum just in case she wanted to add anything. Well, thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Julia. Um, as Debbie said, the two properties adjoin, so there are trails and we have lots of places where you can come, Julia will tell us when, and look for lady beetles. Um, if you do want to visit the museum right now, we're open by appointment, so just give us a call and then we open May 1st. Um, we don't know yet if it's five days a week or seven days a week, but you can come visit us then. So thank you, Julia, and I'm looking forward to learning about lady beetles. Um, so Julia is the Community Outreach Science Naturalist serving the Vermont Center for Eco Studies as their Eco AmeriCorps member. Um, Julia fell in love with the natural world at a very young age, learning about plant medicine from her mother and spending hours exploring the forests around her family's house with her father. Her childhood connection with the outdoors inspired her to pursue a degree in environmental sciences with a focus on wildlife biology at the University of Vermont. Um, where she graduated in 2019. Julia has conducted research for a senior thesis project on soil greenhouse gas emissions, interned for an environmental consulting firm, and worked as a forest health technician at the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative prior to the start of her service tone. Julia's interests are currently focused on community-based conservation initiatives, discerning the intersectionality between culture and the environment, and how this intersectionality can inform management practices that best provide for local communities and ecological systems at once. Julia currently lives in Vermont, spending her spare time birding, painting, climbing, and working on starting a community reforestation project with a friend. For her service at VCE, Julia will be connecting with Vermonters interested in contributing to various community science projects, which is why we are here today, such as the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. So thank you, Julia. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you to take it away. <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, Debbie. And <clears throat> thank you both for having me today. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Awesome. So today I will be giving a presentation on the Lady Beetles of Vermont, Invasions, Extirpations, and Discoveries. Before I begin, I just wanted to give a land acknowledgement. We, well, I am serving from Southern Vermont, which is Abenaki land. What do you think of when you think of a ladybug? also known as a lady beetle. Do you think of a small round beetle that has red wing covers and black spots as you can see in the image on the screen? I want you to kind of keep this specific lady beetle in mind as I proceed with this presentation because this is actually an invasive species. This is the Asian lady beetle which is usually going to be the species that you would find invading your home. And in Vermont, we have many different lady beetle species, both native and non-native. And as you can see, they have a wide, wide variety of appearances. And they also come in kind of different shapes, different sizes. They can be anywhere between you know, a millimeter in length, so really, really small, and 10 millimeters in length, which is around the diameter of a dime. Additionally, you can find lady beetles in all of their life stages. So they start off as these tiny little eggs, which are usually laid in clumps, depending on the species. Sometimes they'll have clumps of eggs that are 
only like four, like three to four eggs. Other times they'll have many more, as you can see in this image here. You can also find lady beetle larvae, which are kind of odd looking. You don't think that this thing turns into a lady beetle. This is sort of um, similar to the transition that a butterfly goes through when it goes from a caterpillar to then, well, egg to caterpillar to then pupa and then to a butterfly. So you can also see here, this is another example of what a different lady beetle nymph looks like or larva. And then you have the pupa here. And oftentimes you're going to find eggs, larva and pupa all on either vegetation, so really on the leaves of plants, or sometimes you'll find them on the bark of trees or of shrubs or other plants. In the United States, or I should say in North America, we have around 475 species of lady beetle, which is a very high number. Lady beetles can be found across essentially all different terrestrial ecosystems, including forests, grasslands, farmlands, and they can even be found in marshes and up at the tops of mountains. Lady beetles play a very, very important role in that many species, not all, there are one or two that directly eat vegetation, but most lady beetle species prey on aphids, mealybugs, scale insects, and other small soft-bodied insects. These small soft-bodied insects directly feed on plants. So lady beetles play a really important role as a biological control agent, which means that they, in feeding on these smaller insects, stop these insects from becoming so numerous that they actually begin to harm the plants that they feed upon. Without our native lady beetles, our ecosystems may become imbalanced as these smaller insects that feed on the plants may become very numerous. And even though we have non-native lady beetles across North America and in Vermont as well, these non-native species are not as evolved with our native pest species, or I should say with our native small insect species. So these native species play a really, really important role. <clears throat> Sadly, there have been widespread declines across North America in our native lady beetle species. There are several different factors that researchers think are contributing to declines, including the introduction of non-native lady beetle species, such as that Asian lady beetle that you saw on the first slide, introduced diseases with those non-native lady beetles. There hasn't been a ton of research done on that, but it is still a potential contributor. Land use change and pesticide use. And the two of these four factors that I want you to really keep in mind are the introduction of non-native lady beetle species and land use change. With the introduction of non-native lady beetle species, such as that Asian lady beetle again, um, these species can compete with native lady beetle species for food frequently grow faster than our native lady beetle species. And all lady beetles are actually cannibalistic. So both the larva and the adult will feed on both their own larva and that of other species of lady beetle. So our, with non-native lady beetles growing faster, they have the ability to more easily consume native lady beetle larva, eggs, et cetera. Also, our native lady beetle species don't really like to eat non-native lady beetle larvae, whereas the non-native lady beetles will eat the native lady beetle larvae and will eat their own larvae. So that creates an additional um, pressure on our native lady beetle species. With land use change, this comes into play a lot with the fall of many small farms across the United States. Lady beetles are highly mobile and even if you have a species that often breeds and inhabits forest ecosystems, lady beetles will move to areas that have really high loads of those small soft-bodied insects like aphids. And typically those are really high in 
farmlands because in America, we usually have um, crops that are more monoculture, which typically ends up having more pest species. So how are lady beetles doing in Vermont? Lady beetles were not really on the radar of the VAL team, which is the Vermont Atlas of Life, a subgroup within the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, until 2018. In 2018, we were sent this historic checklist, which you can see on the screen, that um, was a completed survey of all lady beetle species that had been recorded in Vermont which was finished and published in 1976. When we were digitizing this document, we realized that there is a huge gap in data. Following the completion of the survey, we had very few digital records on lady beetles. And as a result, we were, and you know, kind of keeping in the back of our mind, the fact that there have been lady beetle declines across North America, this was really concerning. We began digitizing both historic records and lady beetle collections from many different places, including the Cornell University Lost Ladybug Project, and then collections from UVM, Middlebury, Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation, most recently the Fairbanks Museum Collection, and we also collected research grade observations from iNaturalist, assembling around 1600 records. At this point, we came to the end of data that was in existence that we knew of, and again, just had so few records from the modern day. However, from this data, we found that there are around 42 species of lady beetle in Vermont, at least there are 42 that have been recorded thus far. 35 of those are native, seven are introduced. And as of 2019, 13 of our native species were missing. Other species seem to be following those national trends of decline, which again is very alarming. To show you a visual representation of kind of what our data flow looks like, you can see here, this is the number of lady beetle species, both native and non-native over time. And the reason why Right here, this number does not re reflect that 42 total of lady beetle species we have in Vermont is because from 1980 through, through the 1990s, many of those non-native species became established in Vermont. And although we don't have the data to say for sure that those non-native lady beetle introductions cause these declines, it definitely looks suspicious, right? And you can see from the work that we have been doing with the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, we're starting to increase that number of lady beetle species that are recorded again. <clears throat> so all of these apparent declines and missing species leads us to the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. So the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas piloted in 2020 and what we are trying to do is complete a survey of lady beetles across the state of Vermont. To do this, we are calling on community volunteers, such as yourselves, hopefully, to help us in our search. Through completing a current up-to-date survey of the lady beetles in Vermont, we hope to understand if those missing species that I talked about are actually extirpated or extinct in the state of Vermont, or if they still exist in low numbers. Through this data, we hope to better inform conservation initiatives that may need to be undertaken, such as potentially reintroducing native lady beetle species, figuring out ways to combat those non-native lady beetle species and other measures. So this kind of gets me into what is this community science framework that we are using and why are we using community scientists? And to kind of start with the why, using community science and engaging community members in research is powerful. So in this graphic, you can see, this is the total number of lady beetle records, not by species, just lady beetles in total over time. You can see that in general, the records are below 100, 
there's that spike around the time that that 1976 record was completed or survey was completed. And then you can see the Vermont Atlas of Life on iNaturalist, which I will talk about iNaturalist momentarily, began in 2012. And you can see that we have this exponential increase in lady beetles recorded, especially between 2019 and 2020 when we piloted that Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. So tapping into our community volunteers has multiple benefits. This increases community engagement with research, resulting in increased awareness for conservation issues, and also just in general, increased engagement in science, which is really, really positive. Also, this reduces costs and increases the chance of finding lady beetles. We are basing this framework both off of other Vermont Atlas of Life projects that we have, and also off of other ladybug research. For example, the Cornell Lost Ladybug Project used a very similar framework, and their community volunteers rediscovered two spotted and nine spotted lady beetle populations in the state of New York. Both of those are native species and both were thought to be extinct in the state of New York prior to these surveys. So this leads us to iNaturalists and how we are collecting community volunteer contributions. For those of you who have not used iNaturalists before, I highly recommend it. Um, if you, after this, want to start using iNaturalist and are unfamiliar with the platform, um, the Vermont Atlas of Life has a ton of resources on how to use this. I have a whole video series I've been doing over the course of my service term. The previous AmeriCorps member has an entire um, Tech Tip Tuesday of different ways that you can use iNaturalist. And iNaturalist itself has a really good help website. Um, so it is very easy to get started on iNaturalist. This is an entirely free platform that connects people with science and also connects people with each other. So the, one of the reasons why we are using iNaturalist is because when you upload observations, which an observation is essentially the basic unit of iNaturalist and is any encounter that you have with one organism, one wild organism at one time. So you want when you're um, photographing organisms that you encounter, if possible, to take multiple photos and upload them all within one observation, which I will show you how to do. And this way, through both the artificial intelligence and iNaturalist, you can get help with identifying whatever the organism is. And then once you have uploaded your observation, other iNaturalist users will help to identify the organism. And once a few people or even just one person has either agreed with your observation identification or has suggested a new one and a couple other people have agreed with that, your observation becomes research grade, which basically just means that your identification has been verified. What this does is allows researchers to then pull those research grade iNaturalist observations into both other databases or just directly downloaded from the site so they can be used for research. So I'm now going to share my screen in iNaturalist and just show you a couple of the powerful aspects of iNaturalist. There we go. <clears throat> so the first aspect of iNaturalist is the explore page. And basically what you can do here is see a map of, right now I have it filtered to just Vermont, and you can see all of these little red dots that are covering the state of Vermont. If I zoom in further, iNaturalist hopefully will load. There we go. You're going to get a bunch of these little teardrops. And each of these teardrops rep represents one observation. And one important thing to note here in the Explore page is you can search either by taxonomic group or species. You can search by location and you can also add all of these additional filters to your search to curate a group of observations of 
whatever either taxonomic group or species or whatever it is you're looking for um, within a specific location bounding. You can also add more filters to add in specific users, photo licensing, projects, which is a really cool aspect of iNaturalist that essentially allows you to curate observations. So we're using this for the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. We have a project for this on iNaturalist. And essentially, after you select all this information here, you would get a curated search result of these observations. So when you go to an observation that catches your interest, you can just click on it and you get taken to the observation page. You can see down here that if another person, so I would be able to suggest an identification or agree with this identification. Um, and if other people had done that, you would get the list of people here. You have annotations, which gives you more information on the observation. You can see all of the photos of the organism uploaded by the user. You have a map that shows you where this was taken. And one important thing to note is you are, when you are uploading your observations, able to obscure your location. So say you have a bunch of observations of organisms at your house, but you don't want your house shown on iNaturalist, you can change the settings in iNaturalist so people are not able to see that exact location, which is really beneficial. Um, another thing that's important to note is either through searching for a species or searching for a taxonomic group, or in this case, I'm in this observation, I can simply click on this organism, you get taken to a taxonomic page. And within this taxonomic page, you have a bunch of information about either this, in this case, a specific organism or an entire taxonomic group, no matter, like, depending on what you search for. You have a map of everywhere that observations of this organism has been uploaded across its range. In this case, you can also filter by location. So I have the United States selected. I can unselect that and then information will reload to, as you can see now, it includes some observations in Canada. You have an about page. This links to Wikipedia. So it depends on the organism. Sometimes there's a lot of information, sometimes there's not much. You have a taxonomic tree, the conservation status, if there is any. And my favorite part is the similar species tab. So this allows you, if you're trying to learn how to say better identify moths, you can look at other species that are commonly misidentified within whatever location it is that you filtered down to for this organism. And this way you can kind of click between different species and learn how to differentiate them. Additionally, you have all this information here, seasonality, history over the course of iNaturalist existence, life stage between adult pupa and not annotated, and sex that is all curated from the iNaturalist observations that are uploaded. Similarly, you also have an identify tab and this has the same filter features as the explore tab. And this is how you are able to go through and help others identify the organisms that they are encountering. And this is how you get those observations to be research grade. So you can see here, this still says needs ID and you're able to click through the photos that the person has uploaded, see where this was observed on the map. And then if you agree with this identification, you can simply click agree. Or if you think if say I was like, oh, this is not partridge berry, I could click add ID and suggest a different identification or simply just agree with the genus. If I wasn't quite sure that it was partridge berry, but I did agree with the genus, then I could do that option as well. So the final thing I'm going to show you in iNaturalist quickly is just how you can upload some photos. All you have to do is click choose files. There are other import options as well. This is simply the easiest. 
And all you do is navigate to the folder where your photos are on your device, single click on the first photo you wish to upload, hold down shift on your keyboard and select the last photo that you want to upload. And then you click open. This will take you to a page with each photo that you have uploaded on its own individual, I call like this one tab here, I call these plates. So each photo will be uploaded to an individual plate. But like I said, you don't want to submit photos of the same individual as separate observations. So you'd want to group these, say these four 14 spotted lady beetle photos into one observation. And to do that, all you have to do is hold down shift on your keyboard again and single click on the ones that you want to combine into one observation on the white part next to the photo. And then up top, you just click combine. And now you can see all four photos are in one plate, which will then be uploaded as one observation. For some reason, iNaturalist really thinks that 14 spotted lady beetles are spot croakers. It does this every time. I don't know why, but all you can do here is click X on the spot croaker if that happens to you as well. And you can see if I just single click on the species name, the artificial intelligence in iNaturalist is now deciding that this is in fact a lady beetle. And you can just click, say you're not entirely confident that it's a 14 spot, just identify down to the level that you are comfortable with. So you could just type in lady beetle here if that was the level of identification that you are comfortable with. You can also add date, you can add location and all of this information species through location is important to add to get your observation to be research grade. Another thing that's important to note is, so I took all of these photos in one field on one day. So what I can do is click select all and then group edit. So you can see here, I can edit multiple species, multiple dates and the location for all of these at once. And then you can also see here, this is where you can change the privacy setting. And there's this little projects tab here, which is where I could add, you see the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas pops up. So I could add these all directly to the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas when I upload them. So that is what I wanted to show you with iNaturalist. I'm now going to pop back into my presentation. Okay. <clears throat> So another excellent feature of iNaturalist is you can actually use this on your mobile device if you have a smartphone. And you have a lot of the same features as the browser version. It just is, it has a little bit less information than the browser version does. So I actually have both the mobile app, which links to my online iNaturalist account. But you see here, you have a similar Explorer page or you can click through all these little teardrops to see the different observations. You have your content and then the iNaturalist newsfeed option under activity. You can see under me, your exact observations. And to upload an observation on the mobile app, you simply use the, um, hold on, I have to move my screen sharing thing. You click the observe tab right here, and then it brings you up to these options. You can either directly take photos of the organism into the app, or you can select previous photos you've taken from your camera roll. I suggest this option because iNaturalist only lets you take one photo at a time, and insects are speedy. So they will usually fly away if you try doing it the iNaturalist way. But once you get your photos, these are some red squirrel tracks. You can simply click again, what did you see? And either type in the name or you can um, select one of the iNaturalist suggestions if the artificial intelligence helps you um, with your identification. And then down here, you have the same options that I showed you on the online upload version. And then you simply click save and it goes into these. You can see in the background here, these are all my observations. And then you can just simply click upload on the side and it will upload to iNaturalist. So I'm going to now connect all of this information I just threw at you about iNaturalist with the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas and some of our findings. 
And when I click to the next slide, I want to direct your attention to the right hand side of the slide. And that did not, these, um, this is supposed to be automated and click through, but sometimes it decides not to work. But anyway, all of these red dots are observations of lady beetles across the state of Vermont. And when the Vermont Atlas of Life started, we had like the amount that's just in this Northeast, Northeast Kingdom part of Vermont across the entire state. And by our pilot atlas year completion, we have all of these observations, which was a really incredible increase. So we have seen an increase in 234 iNaturalist users contributing lady beetle data to iNaturalist for the first time in our pilot year alone. We also have doubled the number of lady beetle iNaturalist observations in one year. Prior to our pilot year of the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, there were 914 research grade lady beetle observations. Oh, no, excuse me. Including the pilot year of the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, we have 1,707 research grade lady beetle observations on iNaturalist. And of that roughly 1,000 observations, 914 of those were made in 2020 in our pilot year, which is 54% of all of the research grade iNaturalist observations in Vermont of lady beetles. Additionally, we now only have 12 species missing. So this is another comparison that I wanted to show you all to kind of demonstrate the power of using iNaturalist so community volunteers can contribute data and also the difference between the state of Vermont where we had the Vermont Atlas of Life team working on finding lady beetles versus in New Hampshire where there is no organization doing this work. So you can see in Vermont, we have over a thousand research grade iNaturalist observations to date. And in New Hampshire, there's only 416. And you can also see the difference in both the number of observers and the number of species. And to kind of dive into this note about the very high number of Asian lady beetle observations, going back to that first slide um, in both Vermont and New Hampshire, you can see here, this is just Vermont specific data. This is lady beetle species, and then the number of records that we have. And you can see that these orange hash lines are invasive species and these solid black bars are native species. And you can see that Asian lady beetles, this is only in 2020, um, by far were the most frequently recorded species. And this again kind of emphasizes the importance of this work we're doing, especially surrounding concerns that non-native species are contributing to native species declines. This is crazy. A few other findings. Our community volunteers have rediscovered four native lady beetle species that were lost for over 40 years. This includes the four-spotted spur-leg lady beetle, which you can see right here on the screen, the convergent lady beetle, undulate sigil lady beetle, and the hieroglyphic lady beetle. Additionally, our community volunteers have found three new species of lady beetle, which were never previously recorded in the state of Vermont. This includes the undoubtable lady beetle, the mountain lady beetle, and the Octavia lady beetle, which again, you can see right here on the screen. So going into this year and this field season, we are trying to increase our lady beetle surveys. And again, this is something if you are not in the state of Vermont that you can definitely participate in, in your own area using iNaturalist. So there are several ways that you can get involved with this research and all of these ways, it is best if you are able to download iNaturalist and upload your lady beetle encounter photos to iNaturalist. 
So the first way is just incidental sightings. If you encounter a lady beetle while you are outside gardening or walking your dog, just snap a couple photos of it and upload it to iNaturalist. The second way that you can um, participate is by active searching. And when you are active searching, it is good to select a location that you will very actively survey, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more when I get to the survey priority blocks. Um, but on this point, you can pick any location that is convenient for you. And part of this that I want to know is if you frequently visit the Birds of Vermont Museum property and the Audubon Vermont property, you can look for lady beetles while you are there and kind of create your own lady beetle block within those properties so that can get surveyed as well. And that will be really, really good data contributed to this project. So when you are active searching, you can visually search, which just means that you scan vegetation for lady beetles. When doing this, I recommend searching the trunks of trees, um, specifically trees that look sick so if you see beech trees that have beech bark disease, which looks like little white specks all over the tree, um, and then there's also this kind of black cankerous goo that comes out from the bark, um, those trees frequently will have twice stabbed lady beetles, which is one of our native species. So that's a good way to look, or any other vegetation that either looks sick or you can tell has a lot of aphids on it. You can also do things called sweep netting or beet sheeting, which basically with sweep netting, you get an insect net, which in our, on our website, we have suggestions of places you can go and either buy an insect net or you can make your own. And basically what you do when you sweep net is you walk around with your net and you simply whack vegetation with the net and knock beetles and anything else that may be on the vegetation into the net. You can do this both with low hanging tree branches, with bushes, and then also with your herbaceous species. Just make sure that you kind of tailor how hard you're hitting the vegetation to the vegetation that you are hitting. So if you're, you know, like in a field or something, you're not really damaging those herbaceous species too badly. Um, after you've taken some sweeps, we also have information on how you can sweep net well. What you want to do is Take the net in your hand and close off the top. And then I also recommend, even if you're just visually searching, to bring clear containers with you. Doesn't matter what the clear container is. I'm sure you probably have something around your house that you could use. And then what you do is simply scoop the lady beetles out of the net into the container so you can photograph them without them flying away. With this, I would very much recommend bringing a cooler with you and an ice pack so you can pop the lady beetles on ice for a couple minutes doesn't hurt them at all it just slows them down because otherwise I have these little scintillation vials that I photograph them in they just run circles around the scintillation vial like a hamster on a wheel it makes it really really hard to photograph them so there's a recommendation for that and then the most active way if you are in Vermont that you can participate in this project is by adopting a survey block of your own. You can do this with a group of people if you would like. And basically what you do is one of you will go on to our Vermont Atlas of Life website, which I'll pop into the chat at the end. And you simply select one of these blocks. So you just click on this and you would get some options that would pop up. You're able to download a map, a topographic map of the block. And you can also sign up to adopt that block. And basically what we did was we gridded out the state of Vermont and then selected an even number of these blocks from each biogeophysical region in the state of Vermont to try and get a representative survey of different habitats. And basically each one of these blocks is roughly three by three miles. And we just asked that you kind of figure out what different ecosystems are in this survey block and then do at least one survey in each of those different ecosystems. So say you have like some wetlands, some forests, and some fields. Getting in three surveys at least, one between each of those um, ecosystems would be enough. But if you either do this with a group or have the capacity to go out more frequently and do more surveys, that would be great. 
And kind of my final note on that is lady beetles become active actually around this time of year. As soon as the snow melts, they start coming out from their overwinter sites in leaf litter, under logs, et cetera, and then start aggregating to breed or just directly will move to where they spend their summers. They sometimes migrate a little bit. Lady beetles are extremely mobile. Um, and you can keep searching all the way through October when it starts getting cold out and then they will aggregate again and go back into the leaf litter to overwinter again. So kind of connecting all of that back to iNaturalist, when you are searching for these lady beetles and taking photos of them, there's a couple things that you want to keep in mind. So again, recommend popping your lady beetle on ice for a couple minutes. Um, what you want to try and do is get multiple photos of the organism from multiple angles. So you see here, I have the bottom of the insect, I have the top, so you can see the wing covers here. And then this one, you get a really good angle of the head and the pronotum, which is that middle section of the beetle. And all of this is important because some species are very, very difficult to tell apart unless you have photos that show all angles of the beetle. And it's also important if you are able to get some sort of size reference. So either bring a ruler with you or you can see here the beetle is near the tip of my finger. And this is from, this is a cropped image from a larger image. So what you can do later is simply measure the reference on your body that's like next to the beetle in the photo and get a size reference that way. Because some of these beetles, you can't tell apart visually, but the size differentiates what the species is. Again, to make sure that your observations are becoming research grade and iNaturalist, it's really important to have an accurate time, date, and location. Even if, again, you want to obscure your location, totally fine. So to close out, I wanted to talk about a couple of our fun native lady beetle species that we have in Vermont, highlighting their ecological importance. The first of which is the eye spotted lady beetle. This is an arboreal or tree living species that is very closely associated with conifers. It grows to be between 7.3 and 10 millimeters in length, again, about the size of the diameter of a dime. So it's one of our larger lady beetle species. And the eye spotted lady beetle is a very important predator of the balsam twig aphid. Research has shown that the eye spotted lady beetle very actively hunts the balsam twig aphid and can actually reduce egg masses of these aphids by about 30%. Individuals of the eye spotted lady beetle will completely destroy aphid colonies once they have located them. So, really important pest control. Also, a research study compared eye spotted lady beetle hunting to Asian lady beetle hunting of balsam twig aphids and found that Asian lady beetles only opportunistically forage on balsam twig aphids, which means that they only eat them if they happen to come upon them whereas the eye spotted lady beetle very actively hunts for the balsam twig aphid and also synchronizes its life cycle with that of the balsam twig aphid. So that kind of shows how native lady beetles are very evolved to hunt and manage native aphid and other soft bodied insect populations. Another species is the convergent lady beetle. This is a habitat generalist, but really likes agricultural crops, specifically wheat, sorghum, alfalfa, vegetables, and orchard crops. So as a result, convergent lady beetles are a very important native species that does agricultural pest control. And you can actually purchase these species to release in your garden or crop fields. That said, convergent lady beetles have a really, really wide distribution across North America and have been in very steep decline. This was one of the most common lady beetle species. And in the past decade or so, we've had only a handful of observations of this beetle in Vermont. So this is a really good one to keep your eyes open for. 
The final lady beetle that I want to talk about today is the marsh lady beetle. This one is much smaller. It only grows to be about four millimeters in length. And as you can see, it's very elongate in comparison to the eye spotted lady beetle and is similar in body shape to the convergent lady beetle. This species, as the name suggests, is found in wetlands, marshes, bogs, and taiga. It can also be found in wet forests, wet fields and meadows, and plays a really important role controlling aphids and scale insects in these habitats. <clears throat> so I am looking forward to all of your questions and really appreciate all of you coming to listen to this today. Again, you can look for lady beetles no matter where you are, they are important everywhere. And hopefully our work here in Vermont will provide a model for other states to look for lady beetles and other insects, and also will hopefully help to better inform lady beetle conservation in general. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for all that information. We've got a couple of questions for you. Um, so the first one here, are there any native lady beetles that could be confused with the Asian beetle? And if I find the Asian beetle, what should I do with them? That is a really good question. There are several lady beetle species that look like the Asian lady beetle. And actually I am right now putting the Vermont Atlas of Life lady beetle atlas website. I just put that link in the chat. Um, on that site, on the left-hand side, you'll see this thing called species profiles. And we have um, information on each species that has been recorded in the state of Vermont, including commonly misidentified with like X, Y, and Z species. So all of the ones that Asian lady beetle can be confused for, like you will see linked in those various species profiles. So that can help you kind of differentiate them. In terms of what to do with them, I think at least for now, the best thing that you can do is just be uploading those observations to iNaturalist so we know where they're found and have a really good idea of their distribution in Vermont. They kind of seem to be found everywhere, but you know, it's, it's good data. Um, I don't really like encouraging people to kill anything in general. Um, because they are still, you know, it's it's not their fault that they're here. And it also, I feel like that poses, suggesting that poses the risk of if you do inadvertently misidentify and there are some that look similar, you accidentally end up killing a native species instead. So I would just recommend, you know, trying to get really good photos of them and uploading them. That said, if they're in your house, they're most likely Asian lady beetles. And that's kind of like, do, do whatever you want with them at that point. <laughs> um, okay. Um, related question. How often should we submit Asian lady beetle counts when there are so many in my house? <laughs> yes. So that is another really good question. Honestly, what you could do at that point is in iNaturalist, there's a couple, there, mm, iNaturalist is not as nice as say eBird is in terms of submitting like one observation with a count. That said, in your observation, there's a section to add notes, like right when you're uploading the observation and if you edit the observation later. So what you could do is just take a couple photos and then in the notes say, this is roughly the estimate or this is the exact number of lady beetles of asian lady beetles that were in my house and then from there when we're like downloading those observations you know if we click on it we can see that there's a high count of them there and then can take that into account great um is the so it's great that you gave us that link or we can find more information about um a species of lady beetle so this is a related question um, is the seven spotted lady beetle a native species? So the seven spotted lady beetle is not a native species. That's actually another one of our non-native species, which is actually like one of the, it's sort of like Asian lady beetle, seven spotted lady beetle, um, 14 spotted lady beetle are kind of like three of the big ones that are really 
really seem to be the top focus of research um, for non-native species that are negatively impacting our native species. So also, you know, a very good one to be uploading so we know where it's found. Okay. Um, so when you are taking um, a photo and you've got an observation you want to upload to iNaturalist, will it tell you whether the species is native or non-native? Yes, iNaturalist actually will after you have uploaded the observation and it will only do this if you like identify it down to species. Um, but if it's non-native or invasive, you'll get a little like red to pink eye at the top of the observation. And that said, iNaturalist does not flag every single non-native species. Um, some of them that like are considered to be naturalized instead of being considered to be invasive, it doesn't have that pop up. Um, that I think is just something, you know, with iNaturalist being this massive, primarily community driven platform. Um, it just, you know, that's something that you can always message curators about and say, hey, this is not native. This should be something that's flagged. Um, that said, on our species profile on our site, every single species is going to tell you um, when you click on the link to the species page, we will tell you whether it is native or non-native. So that is a really good way to find that out. Okay, great. Um, okay, this is a question that somebody else answered in the chat, but you had such a lovely response before that I got to hear before everybody else joined the call today. Are lady beetles, ladybugs, and ladybirds all the same thing? Yes. So where this came from, um, originally, so as kind of a preface to this, lady beetles, all three are the same thing. And lady beetles are found kind of across the entire world, you know, different species, of course. But in Europe, there was a town supposedly that had a really, really bad aphid population that was damaging their crops. And all the people were praying and praying and were like, we don't know what to do. Our crops are gonna fail. Like, we're not gonna have enough food. And a bunch of lady beetles showed up presumably because there were a lot of aphids and decimated the aphid population, which saved the crops. So they named lady beetles there they named them lady birds after the virgin mary um because she was who they prayed to or thanked for saving their crops um the name ladybird and then when it transitioned to america when we were starting to study them here became ladybug just because you know language changes between england and america and then lady beetle is just kind of the quote unquote scientific common name for them, for that taxonomic group. Um, and this comes from, in, in my opinion, is probably because entomologists seem to have a strong distaste for the term bug um, because they are beetles anyway. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, thank you very much for clearing that up for us. Mm -hmm. um, so about the look of um, the different species of lady beetles, um, is the red color indicative of toxicity or a bad taste? Um, and are the yellower slash whiter ones less bad tasting? Not that I plan to eat them, says this comment. <laughs> so a lot of lady beetles, not just, so the red color probably is like, you know, many bright color species associated with that bad taste. Lady beetles, um, it kind of depends on the species and isn't super specific to the color that the species is, but a lot of them, if disturbed, will emit this bad smelling goo. Um, that is actually something that you've probably noticed if you've ever had Asian lady beetles in your house, that like very distinct smell that is associated with them comes from that like, I, it's it's kind of called blood sometimes, but it isn't actually blood. It's just this like goo that they emit from their leg joints. Um, and I don't think that all lady beetle species do that, but a lot of them do. And that does 
you know, that's an attempt to reduce predation. Again, like not super associated with the exact color of the lady beetle. So I don't, I don't think like the marsh lady beetle, which is that like pale yellow color would necessarily be bad tasting, but also if they don't, if they're one of the species that doesn't really emit that goo, then presumably they would be less bad tasting. If you do accidentally eat one, definitely let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna save this one question for our last question. And we've got two minutes here, so this seems right on. Um, so you mentioned that you can actually order lady beetles for your own garden or yard. Um, so this question is asking, are there regulations about the importing of non-native species of lady beetles? That is a really good question. Um, I don't think that there are. As far as I know, actually a lot of the non-native species that we have in America, including the Asian lady beetle, were originally introduced as pest control. That said, many of them actually became established accidentally instead of like those initial attempts to establish them failed. And then it was after they became really established totally by accident, um, people started realizing that, oh, we have native lady beetle species here and oh, they seem to be declining. Um, I don't think that there is any, I, in the research I've done, there isn't any like large scale official thing I've seen that says that you can't import them. Um, but definitely don't quote me on that because I'm not entirely positive. Um, so if you are planning to import large quantities, um, check your local regulations first. <laughs> Um, so then if we are not actively bringing them in, how can we discourage um, Asian beetles from coming? Is that to clarify, Mary, is that like into your house or in general? Mm. So in terms of in terms of establishment in general, that is a really great question. And I don't I don't really know. That would hopefully be something we could get a better idea from um, with the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. A lot of that is just ensuring that when people are importing different specifically agricultural products that they are actually, that there's like some really good regulations in terms of like how those things need to be cleaned and examined beforehand to make sure that non-native insects in general aren't getting brought in because, you know, that's been, we have like beech bark disease, we have the emerald ash borer, we have all of these species that have been introduced through like totally by accident through importing things. Um, so that's one way to stop them from getting in in general, but that does not seem to be something that we've very successfully done. Um, in terms of stopping them from getting established in your house, uh, a lot of it is like figuring out ways to kind of just stop insects in general from getting in your house, which is kind of hard because a lot of times there's just some like small little hole somewhere that isn't necessarily easily visible to you that they're getting in through. But once they are in, um, there's like a bunch of different sprays that you can get. There's Asian lady beetle traps that you can also get. Um, some lady beetles react very well to kind of like pheromone sticky traps and will get attracted to those and stuck so you can just remove them. They really like the color yellow. So I recommend attracting them using that and then you can kind of just scoop them out. Um, also citronella apparently um, or soapy water is a good way like just spurts them with that um, but it is oh yes yes in the house um, yeah it's that's that's kind of hard because I don't I don't really know like 
how well one could insect proof their house. But I guess if you have a very obvious rip in your screen, I would recommend mending that. It does seem like they're very good at getting in and some years more than others. Um, well, that is all of the questions that came through um, that I was able to capture. So Julia, thank you again for your time. And everyone, I would encourage you, iNaturalist is really fun to use. <laughs> we use it um, when out with school groups or our summer camp programs at Audubon all the time. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, um, our properties do touch. Um, and so we are really hopeful for um, folks, if you're out on a hike, um, both the Birds of Vermont Museum trails and Audubon Vermont's trails are open um, every day of the year from sunrise to sunset. So even though our offices are still closed to the public at this time, um, or in that case, the museum, but you can call to visit the museum um, and set up an appointment before they officially announce their um, opening dates. But our trails are always open. So the point is that we hope to see you out there um, with your cameras or your smartphones um, looking for lady beetles and taking photos so we can get a sense of what we have on our property. Um, and if you can't visit us, please head out to your local parks, your backyards. Um, it's kind of fun to put on your like sleuthing detective hat and <laughs> see what you can find when you put your mind to it. So thank you again, Julia, for your time and everyone for joining us. Um, I um, and they're popping for the Birds Vermont Museum um, in the chat too, the phone number, um, if you'd like to call them to either set up an appointment or email um, or get more information from the museum. Um, Aaron via Kerr is poking, po popping that into the chat as well. So thank you everyone for a um, lovely presentation. It's really beautiful outside here. So if you can get outside, I would encourage you to get outside today. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.